Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the student chapter of the Eastern Pennsylvania branch of ASM, I would like to welcome all of you to the 29th annual Philadelphia Infection and Immunity Forum. My name is Lauren Springer, and I'm a third year PhD student at Thomas Jefferson University. I'm co-president with Natalia Benavides of the student chapter. I would like to start off by thanking all of you for being here bright and early on a Friday morning. This year is a little different than our usual forum as COVID-19 has led us to hold this event virtually for the first time. Nonetheless, we are very excited to be here with all of you today. Before we get started with our exciting lineup of talks, I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors whose financial contributions have made today's event possible. First, we would like to thank PBL Assay Science, our annual sponsor of the Sydney Pesca Lecture, which will be our last talk of the day in the afternoon. We would also like to thank ASM National for, for providing us with a conference grant. Finally, I would like to thank the incredible EPA ASM student chapter team for working tirelessly for the past year in organizing this event. Our amazing faculty advisor, Dr. Michelle Kutzler, for mentoring us and answering our countless questions at every step of the way. The student officers, my co-president, Natalia Benavides, our co-vice presidents, Matthew Bell and Kayla Sicaras, secretary, Ronald Lucarelli, and treasurer, Ms. Marissa Egan. Thank you to all of you for stepping up to the challenge of organizing today's forum. In addition to today's forum, we also organized the May monthly meeting during which poster award winners from previous years infection immunity forum give an oral presentation of their research, along with one invited faculty speaker selected by student officers. This year, we had the pleasure of, doctor, of hosting Dr. Matthias Schnell. We also organized a social event for our student chapters and for the past few years, we've been going to the Franklin Institute's Science After Hours. We also collaborate with the Education Subcommittee to provide opportunities for, for professional development. Unfortunately, our event planned for spring 2020 had to be canceled given the current circumstances, but we hope to work with them again in the future so our chapter members can receive training and judge the George Washington Carver Science Fair. We highly encourage students to join the chapter. It's free and it helps us re receive funding to hold more events like the ones I've shared with you today. Also, it's really easy to sign up. You visit epaasm.org here, and this will lead you to our main homepage, where there will be the link join today. Click on this link to register. This will lead you to our main homepage, where there will be the link join today. Oh, sorry. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you again for attending today's forum and turn over to Dr. Dieter Schifferle, the president of the Eastern PA branch of Pennsylvania. Okay. So, so welcome all again. Uh, I'd like again to quickly thank the leadership of the student chapter of our branch, which has presented itself, as well as Dr. Michel Kutzler, our president-elect. They all have worked extremely hard to organize this Zoom meeting. And as well as Dr. Vincent Tam, our skilled video Zoom YouTube jockey. I also would like now to take this occasion to remind everybody, maybe next slide, that our EPISM uh, site also includes our list of monthly seminars. So 10, 10 days ago, we had Dan Potnoy, uh, uh, and, Jan uh, and then in January, we're gonna have uh, Dr. John McAllenas from Harvard, in February, Isabel Coppens, et cetera. You can, can see the whole list there. So we're a very active uh, branch of the SM, and I hope you all will be able to make it. Now, next slide, please. If you miss any seminar, you can also find these seminars on YouTube links uh, whenever uh, the speaker allows us to uh, put these uh, uh, talks on YouTube. So you can find actually these talks uh, uh, under uh, our, in our web website under archives, as shown at the bottom of these slides. Next slide. Since we're a branch of the American Society of Microbiology, I'd like also to advertise National ASM. First, by showing the link at the bottom there where you can become a member to find information on the community of microbiologists, local to international, create networks for colleagues, and also uh, information for students and postdocs professional development, and finally information on scientific meetings, webinars, et cetera. Particularly, next slide, please. <clears throat> the SM Microbe Online, which has many seminars on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, if you haven't 
read enough of it by now, you can go there and hear many very interesting uh, seminars, as well as other scientific presentations such as uh, e-posters, etc. Uh, next slide. Finally, I have some logistical details for the event. For this online forum style, attendees will be muted so that each talk can go to completion. Please, please write your question for the presenters in the chat. Questions will be answered during the allocated time at the end of each talk. If there is not enough time to answer all questions, having them written in the chat will allow the speakers to answer them later with you. With this in consideration, speakers, please be mindful of presentation time. We have lots of amazing speakers at the event today and we would really like to have them all take a full advantage of their time uh, and for this event to be completed in a timely manner. Uh, finally, lunch will be from 11.15 a.m. to 1.15 p.m., during which we'll have posters presentations. We have two sessions. Session one will be for the first hour from 11.15 to 12.15. There, all the odd number posters will be presented, and session two will have the even poster presentations from 12.15 to 1.15 p.m. Okay, so now I leave Natalia Benavides the student chapter co-president to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Watnik. Thank you. Lauren, oh, here is Natalia, very good. <laughs> um, so for our first speaker today, I would like to introduce Dr. Paula Watnik. Dr. Watnik is a senior associate physician in pediatrics of the Division of Infectious Disease at Boston Children's Hospital. She's also an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. She received her PhD from the California Institute of Technology and her MD from Yale University. Over the past 10 years, Dr. Watnick and her laboratory have used bacterial genetics, genomics, proteomics, and metabolomic approaches to, to probe the interaction of microbes with the host intestine. Specifically, her lab is interested in, the, in understanding the impact of intestinal pathogens on host metabolism and nutrition the development of biofilm-based antigen and enzyme delivery platforms, as well as discovering novel natural pro products with antimicrobial activity. Today, we have the wonderful pleasure of listening to her talk titled, How Microbial Metabolites Control Innate Immunity and Metabolism in a Model Host Intestine. Please welcome Dr. Paula Watnick. Awesome. So thank you very much. I'm just gonna, let me see if I can share screen. I will um, hand it over to uh, Matt Bell, who's our uh, co-VP president or co-vice president um, of EPA ASM student chapter. Thanks, Natalia. So uh, like Natalia said, I'm Matt Bell from Drexel University. And along with Kayla, I am a co-vice president of the student chapter. And today I would like to introduce our next speaker and welcome him, Gene Bitt. Bernard Lubin. He is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Michael, Michael Silverman at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he will pre be presenting his talk titled The Notobiotic Mouse Model of Pediatric Host Commensal Interactions. Hello, can everyone hear me okay now? Okay, yep, thank you. We can hear you now. All right. Okay, is my, is my title screen up? Sorry, I can't tell. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be going over my talk, um, which is titled A Notobiotic Mouse Model Pediatric Host Commensal Interactions and share some of the data I've gathered um, developing this model. 
Um, I'll start us off with some basic introduction to um, the microbiome and particularly um, my, um, my point of focus of the microbiome is actually the pediatric pre-weaning microbiome, which um, as of this point has been uh, well characterized to be unique um, in function and composition to that of a post-weaning um, up to an adult microbiome, which is characterized by this plot here of beta diversity, which measures the relatedness between um, samples and metagenomic analyses. And this is a plot looking at um, individual time points of an, of an infant from birth up until weaning. I think this plot ends about a year and a half compared to the microbiome of its mother. And as you can see, um, when the infant is on a solely milk-based diet, its microbiome is uh, very distinct to that of its mother. And, but as the transition from milk to solid food begins, you start to see the slow progression to a microbiome that is primarily being driven by this um, dietary shift to one that resembles that of an adult. And, and of course, mice, uh, which is our model species for many of the things that we do, we see a similar phenomenon occur. Um, mice, of course, uh, develop much more rapidly than we do. And mice typically continue to be on a solely milk-based diet between uh, probably between 14 to 16 days old. And then they slowly start to transition in between a mixture of milk and solid food up until 21 days where we physically wean them from their um, mothers and which then they proceed to be on a solely solid food based diet. And these shifts similar in humans are, um, are um, realized in metagenomic data looking at um, alpha diversity at day 14. Um, you see uh, a, a microbiome dominated by mostly facultative anaerobes, which is consistent with the microbiome of a pre-weaning um, um, infant. And as the transition to solid food begins, you see the increase in bacteroides and clostridial species that are characteristic of an adult microbiome. And this is uh, also um, visualized in the beta diversity where you see um, clustering between day 14 samples and day 18 samples with day 70 samples on the other end of the axis. And with day 18 samples being split between the two populations indicating um, whether these individuals had started eating solid food earlier than others. So um, the reason why I'm particularly interested in the pediatric microbiome is that several studies have found that perturbations in the early life microbiome has um, serious impacts on long-term health. And this is in spite of the microbiome returning to what appears to be a normal state um, after um, childhood. And this perturbation, generally the studies have um, attributed this to um, antibiotic exposure early in life has been linked to um, um, immunological diseases such as asthma and atopic dermatitis specifically. Um, and in particular for my lab, my lab um, studies type one diabetes and my, uh, my PI, while he was a postdoc, discovered something very interesting in the nod mouse model of type one diabetes and that when he treats um, nod mice with um, E alpha 16 nod mice, which have a E alpha transgene that protects them from spontaneous diabetes development, when they treat either the pregnant dams or pups three weeks um, that are younger than three weeks of age, um, insulitis score significantly increases, which insulitis is uh, a metric that we use as a precursor to type one diabetes development. And likewise, you see an increase in insulitis from three to six weeks of age, but no difference if vancomycin was given to the alpha 16 mice six week, post six weeks of age. So it indicates that there seems to be a, um, an important critical window of protection that involves the, um, the pre-weaning microbiome and nod mice and, and the type one diabetes model. And I was tasked with investigating um, the, role of the, um, the role of the microbiome and protecting from type one diabetes, particularly the pre-weaning microbiome. And, to, and typically when we want to figure out what a bacteria is doing, um, the microbiome is even in a pre-weaning microbiome is quite complex and it's difficult to tease apart um, which uh, members are doing what. So um, scientists who study these questions typically develop tools using germ-free and notobiotic mice for studying host commensal interactions that allow us to 
whittle down the microbiome to just a handful of species that we are able to either genetically ma manipulate or track to really get a, a deeper understanding of the processes involved in this protection. Um, so of course, because this is a commonly used technique in studying these types of interactions, there are notobiotic mouse models available and that are well characterized. Um, the most notable would be Alter Shadler's flora or ASF and a, a newly developed consortia called Oligo MM12. But um, neither of these microbiomes were, um, were developed to specifically mimic the, the function and um, capacity of the pediatric, um, mouth, um, pediatric microbiome, which we've, decided, we've, we've determined to be the critical point. So my goal is to ultimately de determine how does the early life microbiome impact the long-term health of the host, host. And to do this, I want to develop a tractable notobiotic mouse model of the pediatric intestinal microbiome with the uh, hypothesis that a simplified community of bacteria derived from pre-weaning mice would be able to recapitulate the features of the early life microbiome. So this is just a, a workflow of how I, how I constructed my pediatric defined community, which we have dubbed uh, PETSCOM for short. Um, so here, um, so we took 14 day old um, SPF nod mice from our um, regular um, mouse colony, homogenized the small intestine, cecum and large intestine, and plated those on four different media in three different conditions, anaerobic, aerobic, and a 5% CO2 enriched environment and started isolating species to build our culture collection while simultaneously um, sequencing the, the cultural plates and the total community to see um, what type of coverage we could get from culturing. And then um, selecting um, um, what we decided to be at least under 10 and we decided on nine micros based on their relative abundance in the donor mice, um, taxonomic diversity, and as well as keg ortholog coverage to try to uh, recapitulate as much function as we could in a handful of species. And after this criteria, we, we settled on nine, um, nine bacteria that we, we dubbed our PeaceCom consortia, which we then um, inoculated in germ-free um, black six mice. So this is just looking at the um, taxa bar plots of our donor mice to get an example of what the the microbiome looks like at this age point in our colony. As, as you can see before, I, um, there's a much lower diversity at this time point. You can see in the small intestine, it's dom dominated primarily by Lactobacilli acea, as you would probably expect from a mouse that's solely on a milk-based diet. And as you go down the lower GI to the sequin and large intestine, you start to see the introduction of uh, bacteroides species, particularly uh, Porphyrmundi acea or Tanarelli acea, which I think is referred to now. A parabacteroides species, which starts to take up some of this niche. Um, because of this, these are the nine members that we've decided upon. So we have Lactobacillus johnsonii, Parabacteroides dysotonius, and Lactobacillus murinus. Those, those are the top three species we saw and rounded it out taxonomically with an Enterococcus species, two Staphylococcus species, uh, two Clostridial species, Intestinale and Anarcyphes KK, as well as a proteobacteria um, representative in Enterobacter. Here, this is looking at the read coverage of PEDSCOM and the total um, compared to um, in read depth versus the total community and just the PEDSCOM members. And you can see that just those nine members cover from 80% in the small intestine all the way up to 99% of the total read depth in the donor organ sites, while simultaneously only uh, representing around 10% of the microbes present in our adult population, in our colony. So we think these microbes are somewhat um, more defined, more related towards um, juvenile mice than adults. So with our consortia in play, we wanted to answer some questions. Primarily, does PEDSCOM colonize the mouse, of course, under germ-free settings? Is this colonization stable and can it be vertically transmitted? Does weaning impact the rel relative proportions of PEDSCOM members? And does PEDSCOM support the de development of an adult immune system? So to do this, we um, as we develop three not well two notobiotic systems and our germ PBS germ-free controls, where um, four to six week old dams are garbaged with our PEDSCOM consortium and the sequel contents of six of a six week old nod mouse to generate um, 
a positive control that we dub SPF com. And we allowed these to breed out under, notab um, under isolator conditions and performed our experiments on the F1 plus generations. So this is just looking at the orally gavaged, um, I guess, progenitor mice for our two, um, um, our two notobiot communities. Looking at PEDSCOM, you can see um, at day one, what you would expect is to dominate by um, facultative anaerobes, particularly this Enterobacter species. And then after, just after day two, uh, Parabacteroides starts to take up uh, more space in the stool and it stays relatively stable out until four weeks. Um, in contrast, you look at the SPF com, which um, exhibits a, um, a transition that's more what you would expect in a, a wild type mouse dur um, during um, ontogeny, where the first three days of post um, gavage, you see again a domination from facultative anaerobes, Enterobacter aceae, which then starts to make way at four days to um, Clostridial and Bacteroid. Um, Bacteroidetes species that are more characteristic of mouse stool. Um, so this tra this um, transition in staticness in PEDSCOM is um, capitulated in the F1 um, F1 plus generations post weaning. You can see in the SPF comp a similar transition that seems to be precipitate um, seems to be driven by um, by the introduction of solid food where you start to lose um, Enterobacteriaceae and Lactobacillus species and the introduction of S247 and clostridial taxa. While looking at the PEDSCOM, um, the relative abundance of the nine members stays relatively static, even upon introduction of solid food. This is uh, particularly highlighted by looking at PEDSCOM members in a SPFCOM, where um, at day 14, they encompass about 50% of the microbiome and slowly whittle down to about um, an average of less than five by 28 days of age. Um, just to kind of hammer the point home, um, this is looking again at a beta diversity plot that I had shown previously, where you see um, a nice clean transition in our SPF comp mice from day 14 samples to day 21 to final day 28, and nice clear um, delineation between those groups. But when you compare to the SPF comp, not only is there no clear separation between um, the, the different ages, um, they also cluster more um, similarly to the day 14 SPF comp day, um, sample points. And next we wanted to, of course, because we, we study immunology in the host um, commensal interactions, we wanted to try to use a metric that, um, a metric that indicates a, a, what would be a wild type transition, um, an immunological transition from weaning, um, a weaning marker, which is what I meant to say, a microbially inclus, um, induced weaning marker. And for this, um, we decided to use the generation of peripheral Tregs that are um, highlighted by our, our gamma helios positive, our gamma positive helios negative Tregs. And we see um, an SPF com as well as PEDS com, an increase in these peripheral Tregs um, that through weaning, and none in germ-free um, in the small intestine, as well as in the large intestine, and actually a significantly higher amount of peripheral Tregs in SPF-COM versus PEDS-COM. And next, we wanted to do a couple of experiments to check the, the malleability of our PEDS-COM model. Um, we wanted to introduce a commensal to see if we could um, indicate any type of immune response to the introduction of a no novel species. For that, we use Acromantia mucinophila, and we introduced this successfully in our PEDSCOM adults, um, getting up to very high um, counts in relative abundance relative to PEDSCOM. And we also, at least in the cecum and small intestine, saw um, significant increases in those peripheral Tregs due to the acromancia induction. And next, we wanted to see if um, PEDSCOM, um, if PEDSCOM, so um, pediatric mice, um, uh, tend to be more susceptible to salmonella infection, and we wanted to see if PEDSCOM adults followed that similar phenotype. So we inoculated, we infected um, SPFCOM and PEDSCOM adults with salmonella, and we saw a significant difference in mortality between our two notobiotic groups, and as well as significant increases in bacterial load in the spleen pyre patches and stool. 
I seem to be running out of time, so I'll skip this because it's preliminary data and just go to my conclusions. That um, So conclusions are we uh, successfully developed an eight member pediatric defined community called PEDSCOM. Um, and we determined that to use to determine what components of the immune system are de dependent on the development of an adult microbiome. We see that PEDSCOM is distribution is stable during the weaning period. Uh, PEDSCOM exhibits uh, stunted gut immunity, um, leading to lower inducible Treg levels, and PEDSCOM is more susceptible to salmonella infection. Ongoing work is uh, we're looking at metabolomics and transcriptomic analysis of PEDSCOM and comparing it to pre-weaning mouse and human microbiomes. Um, antibody response to PEDSCOM versus SPFCOM. Um, intestinal histology. Um, looking at for development as well as spatial configuration of PISCOM members and um, function of PEDSCOM in our not mouse model type 1 diabetes. So um, with that, I'd like to thank my lab, um, my PIs, uh, Michael Silverman and my co-PI, Paul Planet, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Looks like we have uh, a question in the chat. And so the question is, is there a difference in microbiome in breastfed versus infant formula fed newborns? Um, I'm there, there is, I only, I only know that literature in passing, but I do know that several studies have found some differences in the microbiomes between the two that I think that's actually pretty well established, but I can't tell you specifically what those differences are. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, are PEDSCOM mice more susceptible to asthma or other diseases besides pathogen infections? I, uh, well, we haven't really investigated that. I could tell you at least anecdotally, uh, PEDSCOM mice appear to be healthy. They don't seem to um, suffer from any, any health defects in adulthood. There seems to be a little failure to thrive at, during development that I had kind of had to breeze past, but that's still in its very, preliminary stages, so I hesitate to say anything about that data, but there might be some early um, developmental defects, but I don't at least anecdotally notice any differences in the adults in terms of health. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time for our break at 10.05, so if there's any additional questions, you can put them in the chat. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you so much, Dr. Lubin, for your talk. Uh, my name is Michelle Kutzler. I am the student chapter faculty advisor. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending our morning session. Right now we have a break and I just want to uh, just make a couple announcements. Uh, the first is, just share these slides here. Uh, again, we're on break right now, so if everyone could come back for our rest of our morning session, we're going to begin again at 10.15 a.m. with our uh, graduate students and our postdoctoral presentations. And I also want to just invite everyone to stay uh, and enjoy our poster presentations. We have 22 posters that will be presented um, between Odd number posters will be presented between 11.15 and 12.15. And then our even number posters will be presented from 12.15 to 1.15. So during our lunch break today, if you could please uh, stop and visit some of our posters, what I'll do is this is in the conference booklet that was emailed to all of our registrants, but I will also uh, post this in the chat and what to enter their poster rooms, you click on the Zoom link and the presenters will be there with their posters. And so I, I highly encourage everyone to visit our posters at lunch today. Um, and then this afternoon, I, I would like to invite everyone to stay the whole day. Not only will we be giving out our poster awards and our pre presentation awards today at the end of our, our day, but I'd also like to congratulate Dr. Stanley Plotkin, who is receiving the 2020 Sydney Pesca lectureship. So please stay and, and return to, to see our talk later, his talk later today. And, and to, again, thanks to our sponsor, PBL Assay Science, for sponsoring that lectureship. So, all right, thank you so much, everyone. We're going to take a break and we'll see everyone back at 10.15.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm going to kick off the next portion of our day. I just wanted to um, introduce myself once again. My name is Kayla Sakaris. I am from Drexel University. I am the co-VP of the EPASM Student Board, and I work with Dr. Garth Ehrlich. So uh, just a quick reminder, please post all of your questions within the chat. And I have the pleasure of introducing our first graduate student speaker. So first off, um, the graduate student speaker that will be presenting for this session is Rina Matsuda. They're from University of Pennsylvania, and they're working with Dr. Igor Brodsky. Today, they're gonna to be presenting their talk titled, Inflammatory Monocytes Enhances Control of, um, Enhanced Control of Yersinia Pseudotuberculosis by Intestinal Pyogranulomas. Um, Rina, welcome, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much for that introduction. So I'll go ahead and share my slides. All right. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Rina Matsuda, and today I'll be talking about um, how um, Yersinia infection is controlled in the intestine following up to two great talks we've had this morning um, about intestinal um, infection. And so um, kind of big picture, the thing that really fascinates me about the study of infectious disease is how over time um, pathogens and their hosts have really engaged in an evolutionary arms race. And so over time, as um, pathogens have grown increasingly able to evade the immune response, um, the host in turn has needed to evolve more complex immune responses in order to deal with these hard to clear pathogens. And so one such example of a complex immune response is granuloma formation. And granulomas are an aggregation of immune cells that are thought to sequester pathogens um, and prevent their spread. And so granulomas are comprised of a lot of different types of immune cells, um, which can include macrophages um, and also other cells like neutrophils that are thought to surround pathogens and really encapsulate them. And so granulomas are a hallmark of both infectious and non-infectious chronic immune stimulation. The um, most uh, well-studied example are granulomas during tuberculosis infection that form in the lung, but also during parasite infections and non-infectious contacts such as Crohn's disease in the intestine and around the suture um, in the skin um, can also induce granuloma formation. But in the context of infection, it's still unclear um, whether or not granulomas play a protective or pathological role in the control of pathogens. And so in tuberculosis, even though human patients um, form granulomas that control infection, um, it's also known that the bacteria can um, take advantage of this niche in order to replicate um, and use nutrients there. And so um, one model pathogen that my lab uses to study the interaction between Yersinia and innate immunity is Yersinia pseudotuberculosis which is a cousin of Yersinia pestis that causes plague, but Yersinia pseudotuberculosis is an oral pathogen of both humans and mice that first infects the uh, small intestine and then can disseminate to um, systemic organs, including the spleen, liver, and lungs. And Yersinia is able to block innate immune cell uh, function by use of a type three secretion system, which is a needle-like apparatus that injects uh, host cell cytosol directly with bacterial effector proteins known as YOPs in Yersinia. And these YOPs can then block functions of innate immune cells, including phagocytosis and inflammation. And so um, during Yersinia infection, it's known that granulomas form in draining lymph nodes and peripheral organs. And this has been relatively well characterized uh, in an example here of a mouse um, lymph node during infection from one of our previous papers shows this round structure uh, that forms, that surrounds the bacteria um, inside of the mesenteric lymph node. And also others have shown um, in peripheral organs such as the spleen uh, in this immunofluorescence image that Yersinia, that's stained in blue, 
in the middle is surrounded by this highly organized collection of immune cells that are recruited that then sequester the bacteria. So here neutrophils are stained in red, and then INOS positive cells that are um, likely monocytes or macrophages are stained in green that take up distinct um, spatial spaces uh, around the bacteria. However, although all of this work has been done to characterize granuloma formation in the peripheral organs, relatively little is known about the infection of Yersinia in the intestine. And we think that since this is the first organ that's infected, the gut plays a very key role in um, functioning as a barrier against Yersinia infection um, to establish the infection. And so in studying the enteric uh, response to Yersinia during infection, we noticed in the mouse model that when you take um, a mouse intestine, and uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the intestine that's been cut open and the luminal contents flushed out. When you look at the uninfected control versus the Yersinia infected gut, you can see these macroscopically visible white dots, which are granulomas that form in the intestinal mucosa during Yersinia infection. And to our knowledge, this is the first time in the literature that uh, granuloma formation has been described in the intestine during Yersinia infection in mice. And so when you look at where these granulomas are forming, uh, they are enriched in the jejunum and ileum, which are the distal segments of the small intestine, but also are found in the duodenum and the large intestine. And per mouse, about 20 to 30 of these granulomas form that are visible macroscopically by eye. And so using this, this system, we're interested in interrogating what factors control granuloma formation and function in the intestine during Yersinia infection. The first question that we wanted to ask is what are the factors that induce uh, intestinal granuloma formation? And so since Yersinia is an orally acquired um, bug, uh, it starts out in the lumen and then somehow uh, translocates into the underlying lamina propria underneath the epithelial cells, where it then um, is engulfed within this granuloma structure. And we want to know what are the bacterial factors that lead to uh, the recruitment and aggregation of these immune cells, and then also what are the host factors that drive the recruitment of these cells from circulation. And next, we want to know um, how do the immune cells that are recruited then communicate with each other within the granuloma to mediate bacterial restriction and host protection. And so once the cells are here, how do they talk to each other to prevent bacterial escape from the granuloma into the non-granuloma areas of the gut? And then how does that uh, impact downstream um, spread of the bacteria to systemic organs? So first, we wanted to take a closer look histologically at these granulomas that are forming in the gut. And so what I'm showing you here are small intestines of Yersinia infected or uninfected controls that have been rolled and sectioned. And the granulomas look like this, where there's a large aggregation of immune cells um, that's underneath the epithelial cells um, that are organized in villi and crypts up here. And then we also noted that around the granuloma, there's also a lot of epithelial cell hyperplasia or proliferation, which is uh, seen by this bubbling of the epithelial cells that are uh, proliferating. And also we saw that the muscularis, which is the lightly staining area underlying the epithelial cells is also inflamed and um, elongated. However, interestingly, when we look at the infected portions um, of the tissue in, or the non-granuloma portions of the infected intestine, it looks pretty similar to the uninfected controls, suggesting that Yersinia infection in the intestine is highly focal and localized to the granulomas. Next, we were curious if these granulomas contain viable bacteria. And so we took transverse sections of the small intestine. Uh, and when you look at the granuloma itself um, and you zoom in, we noticed um, that this white arrow is pointing to uh, small microcolonies of bacteria that stain in a more light color than the kind of sea of nuclei that surround it that stain more darkly that are the immune cells. And then next, um, we took advantage of the fact that we could macroscopically identify these structures. 
and we use the punch biopsy tool in order to biopsy the granulomas, as well as the non-granuloma areas of the infected intestine. And when we plate, the, plate these on auger, we find that the granulomas have a very high burden of live Yersinia, whereas the non-granuloma areas have a low burden, again suggesting that Yersinia infection in the intestine is highly focal and concentrated to the granulomas. So next, we wanted to investigate the role of um, bacterial virulence and bacterial factors in the formation of intestinal granulomas during Yersinia infection. And so as I talked about before, Yersinia uses a type 3 secretion system to inject YOPs that then block um, innate immune cell function. And Yersinia is a very genetically tractable bacteria, especially because it's type 3 secretion system and all of the YOP effector proteins are encoded on one virulence plasmid that we can genetically ablate. And so when we take this plasmid cured strain that no longer expresses its type 3 secretion system in the dark gray circles, and we infect these um, bacteria into mice, uh, we find that in the pyrus patches and mesenteric lymph nodes, which are the lymphoid tissues of the intestine, um, the plasmid cured bacteria are able to colonize the intestinal um, lymphoid tissue although maybe to a lower degree in the pyrus patches, uh, which is consistent with the published literature. But when we look at granuloma formation by eye, we find that we cannot um, detect any granulomas in the plasmid cured um, infected mice, showing that the type three secretion system is necessary for granuloma formation during Yersinia infection. And next, um, to bring you to a model slide, uh, we've shown that the Yersinia type three secretion system is necessary for the granuloma formation, but we don't yet know what cells are being targeted and what uh, cues are being released that then lead to secretion system dependent granuloma formation in the intestine. So next we wanted to start to characterize the host response uh, side of things in granuloma formation. And we wanted to start to take a look at what types of cells were in these granulomas. And to do this, we wanted to take a flow cytometry approach. So first, we hypothesized that monocytes and macrophages would be present in these structures, since these cells are very common in other granulomas um, in infection. And so these cells can be distinguished by a surface marker CD64. Next, we hypothesized that neutrophils would also be present um, based on the histology. And these cells by flow can be characterized by the surface marker Li6G. So first to start with the monocytes and macrophages, again, which are um, CD64 positive, when we took out the granulomas um, from the mice, uh, and then we looked at the surface marker CD64 on all of the viable immune cells, we found this population of cells that was CD64 positive. And then next, when we compared the granulomas to non-granuloma infected tissue and uninfected controls, um, and then we looked at the CD64 positive population of monocytes and macrophages, we can identify different um, subsets within this population by looking at the expression of Li6C and MHC class two. And so when we take the Li6C high cells as monocytes and then the Li6C uh, low cells as macrophages, and we quantify those populations um, between these three different samples, you can see that the granulomas specifically are highly enriched in both monocytes and macrophages compared to the non-granuloma tissue and the uninfected control tissue. Uh, and then next, um, when we looked at Li6G, which is the surface marker for neutrophils, there's a lot of neutrophils as well uh, in these granulomas. And so next, we wanted to ask functional questions about the role of monocytes in these Yersinia granulomas. And so we took CCR2 deficient mice, um, which are um, kind of deficient in monocytes since CCR2 is necessary for monocyte egress out of the bone marrow. And these mice are denoted as GFP, GFP, since GFP is knocked into the locus. And so the homozygous mice are deficient in CCR2. And when we did this and we looked by eye, the granulomas still form. However, when we looked at the bacterial burdens, while we found no difference within the granulomas, we found that in the non-granuloma areas of the intestine, 
uh, the monocyte deficient mice have a higher bacterial burden, suggesting that Yersinia control is defective in the non granuloma areas of the intestine um, of these mice. And when we looked histologically at the structure of the granulomas in these mice, uh, we found that um, in the CCR2 monocyte deficient mice, um, the bacteria look cloud like um, and larger compared to. Um, the small bacterial microcolonies and the wild type granulomas with the white arrows. And then also there seems to be fewer neutrophils, which are denoted by this uh, black arrow around um, the granuloma. And when we have blinded scoring done by pathologists, although the uh, overall inflammation is not different between the two groups, when we look specifically at the number of bacterial colonies um, and also specifically at the ones without inflammation, we find that while in the wild type setting, all the bacteria are um, surrounded by inflammation, in the absence of monocytes, um, there are these colonies that don't have inflammation. And so to bring you to a model slide, um, in the wild type setting, granuloma formation happens and bacterial control in the intestine. However, in the CCR2 knockout background, um, there seems to be an architectural defect in the granulomas where there's a central area of necrosis that happens um, and uh, bacterial escape. And so to go a little bit faster, since I'm running out of time, uh, in the monocyte deficient mice, the bacterial burdens are higher in a lot of the peripheral organs tested, and these mice also succumb to acute infection. Uh, and so to bring back to the model, um, in the monocyte deficient mice, there's a defect in granulomas and also a defect in the systemic organ control of your synia. And so to wrap up, um, we've found that Yersinia pseudotuberculosis is um, providing a tractable model to study granuloma formation in the intestine during bacterial infection. And so we have future directions to interrogate the roles of inflammatory monocytes, as well as neutrophils um, in the control of Yersinia in the intestine. And so I'd like to acknowledge my lab, um, especially Daniel, who's pictured here, who I worked closely with in order to do this project. And also the people at the Comparative Pathology Corps who've been really instrumental in the uh, histological assessment of these granulomas. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Rena. wonderful talk. Um, there are some questions in the chat. The first is from Dr. Kutzler. And she asked, what types of pro-inflammatory cytokines are macrophages secreting? Is MCP, uh, NCP1 chemokine also important in mediating the function of the macrophages? Right, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so we've profiled some cytokine production in these granulomas, and we know that the, um, like, pretty common um, innate cytokines such as like IL-1, beta, IL-6, um, TNF are produced uh, in the granulomas. And we also know that there's a role for TNF in uh, the actual like control of bacteria within the granulomas. Um, and then uh, you specifically asked about NC MCP1, uh, which is CCL2, which acts directly on CCR2 uh, that I was talking about. Um, and so we know that in the, like, the CCR2 knockout mice, there is a lot of MCP1 that accumulates probably since it's not binding to its receptor. Um, but we're not sure, like, if there's a role locally in the intestine for MCP1 or if it's just um, kind of a facet of the model where, you know, the receptor is knocked out and then the monocytes get stuck in the bone marrow. Perfect. And I think we have time for one more. Um, the next question is, are wild type mice susceptible to Yersinia pseudotuberculosis infection in this model? Meaning, do they clear the bacteria or is it background dependent, you know, mainly um, B6 versus BLBC um, versus 129? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the uh, wild type setting, it is strain dependent. And then it's known that the C57 black six mice that we use are resistant to infection and they clear the infection, um, you know, after like a few weeks. Um, whereas I think valve C mice are more susceptible. Um, 
and tend to succumb to infection. I'm not sure if it's 100%, but I think they're more susceptible than the black six mice. Thank you. And um, unfortunately, Rina, that's all the time we have. Uh, there are a couple of questions which I will send to you shortly. Thank you so much. And I believe the next person is up. Sorry, you didn't hear me before. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Ron Lucarelli. I'm a graduate student at Temple University and I'm the current secretary on the Student Leadership Board. And this morning, it's my uh, honor to introduce our next student speaker, Alicia Segrist. She's in the lab of Dr. Sarah Cherry at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's going to be giving a talk entitled Microbiota Derived Cyclic Dinucleotides Drive Dish Sting dependent enteric antiviral immunity in enterocytes. Alicia, when you're ready, the room is yours. Okay, thank you um, for that introduction. Um, I just also would like to say, like I'm usually the only person talking about Drosophila, so it was um, really great to be able to hear Dr. Watnick's talk this morning. Um, okay, so, Sorry, it's not letting me advance my slides. Okay, um, so as um, everyone at this talk knows, um, the microbiota has been described as influencing many different aspects of intestinal biology and immunity. This cartoon here just shows how some of these that have been described like short chain fatty acids, either interact with the epithelium or with the innate immune cells in the liner propria. And while some of these, um, compounds and how they um, interact with the epithelium and the immune cells have been characterized, there are still many other microbi microbial mediators whose influence on immunity is unknown. Um, so to address this, the Cherry Lab uses Drosophila as a model because of the powerful genetic tools um, like the UAS scalp 4 system, which allows us to specifically overexpress or knock down a gene of interest in um, the whole animal or in a cell and tissue specific manner. And since we're interested in studying the microbiome, um, Drosophila has a much more simple microbiome. Um, there are five major species that make up the majority of the microbiome with both gram negative and gram positive bacteria present. And one of the species, Lactobacillus plantarum, is also found in the human microbiome. Um, so the simplicity makes it much easier um, to understand functionally how each species is interacting with the uh, intestine. And there's functional and cellular conservation of the intestine. So this cartoon on the right um, has the areas of the mammalian intestine and Drosophila intestine that perform the same function color-coded. And there are the same cell types like enterocytes, intraendocrine cells and intestinal stem cells, and similar signaling pathways that control differentiation and proliferation of the intestine. Since I'm interested in the role of the microbiome um, during infection, um, I just started with looking to see how the microbiome influences either oral infection or systemic infection. So um, this cartoon on the left on the top is um, a diagram of how oral infections are done. So I take slides and either mock or antibiotic treat them. So antibiotic, antibiotics are directly added on top of the food. So the flies are forced to eat it. Um, they're starved for an hour and then placed on vials that has um, the virus, Simbis virus, which is an alpha virus that I'll be using throughout the rest of the talk. Um, and then at six or seven days post infection, I dissect the intestines, um, and then pool 15 intestines together and then do qPCR to quantify um, viral RNA levels. Um, basically the same thing is repeated, but instead of starving them and orally infecting them, the flies are injected with virus and then at seven days they're collected for qPCR. So during oral infection, um, antibiotic treatment results in a significant increase in symbis infection of the intestine. Um, but during systemic infection, antibiotic treatment doesn't influence 
um, the amount of Cindis RNA in flies. Um, and since uh, the data I just showed you suggests that the microbiota is providing some um, compounds or some interaction with the intestine that is resulting in protection from infection, we're interested in characterizing um, uh, what these compounds could be. And one of um, the things we're interested in are cyclic dinucleotides, which are these essential secondary messengers in bacteria um, that are basically produced by all bacteria that either make CDI AMP or CDI GMP. So to see if um, it's likely that these compounds are produced by the five major commensals that we find in the microbiome of the Drosophila we have in our lab. Um, I just looked at the um, sequences deposited in NCBI to see if any of them contain a GGDEF domain, which is the domain present in all diguanolate cyclase enzymes, which are responsible for producing CDIGMP. And so four of the five um, commensals do um, have, contain this protein, um, suggesting they are producing cyclodinucleotides. So we're interested in cyclodinucleotides because of their known role in um, interaction with sting, which is this broadly antimicrobial protein um, that is antiviral against DNA viruses and against bacteria. So sting is activated by binding cyclic dinucleotides, and these can come from bacteria or from the endogenous um, DNA binder CGAS. And since it seems that the Drosophila microbiome is producing these cyclic dinucleotides, we hypothesize that the microbiome might be providing this pool of cyclic dinucleotides that are then interacting with steam to inhibit RNA virus infection. So the next experiment I wanted to do is just to see if sting is antiviral in the intestine. Um, so I either orally infected flies or systemically infected flies. And during oral infection, I saw sting is antiviral, um, but it's not antiviral during systemic infection. So as I mentioned previously, we can specifically knock sting down in different cell types. So I either knock sting down only in enterocytes, only in intestinal stem cells, or only in interendocrine cells. So when sting is only knocked down in enterocytes, the intestinal stem cells and interendocrine cells are still producing sting. And I see sting is um, specifically antiviral in enterocytes. Um, since uh, I saw sting as antiviral and I know the microbiome is protective, the next experiment I wanted to do was to see if cyclic dinucleotides influenced virus infection at all. So I took flies and I had treated them and then either fed Symbis or fed Symbis and CDIGMP at the same time. So during oral infection, I see that antibiotic treatment results in a significant increase in infection and that feeding of CDIGMP to antibiotic-treated flies is sufficient to protect from this increase in infection seen by loss of the microbiota. However, um, when flies that are either conventional, which is the data I'm showing here, so they have a microbiome, or flies are antibiotic-treated, um, which data I'm not showing, um, cyclic dinucleotides are not antiviral during systemic symbis infection. Um, since I see during oral infection um, that CDIGMP is protective, um, I next wanted to know whether this is sting dependent. So I set up a very similar experiment, um, but I used um, either control flies um, or flies where sting is knocked down only in enterocytes. And I see in these driver control flies that CDIGMP is still protective but this protection is lost when sting is absent in enterocytes, indicating that sting is required for CDIGMP mediated protection from infection. Um, so in mammalian biology, sting is, um, once activated, is described as acting through interferon and NSCAPB signaling and other less characterized pathways like autophagy activation. And it typically, um, interacts with these downstream effector pathways through the protein TBK1. 
So Drosophila only has this gene called IK2, which is highly similar to human TBK1 and IKK epsilon. Um, and I'll be referring to as TBK1 in the rest of the talk. Um, but it um, hasn't had a well-characterized role in antiviral immunity um, in Drosophila before. So I took flies where TBK1 is knocked down and in parasites and infected with Symbis. And I see that TBK1 is antiviral, but TBK1 is not antiviral during systemic infection. Um, and I next wanted to know if TBK1 is downstream of Sting and Drosophila, then I would expect it to be required for um, CDIGMP's protection from infection. So I um, fed either control flies or flies where TBK1 is knocked down in enterocytes. And I see that um, CDIGMP protection is lost when TBK1 is knocked down. So um, after finding that um, cyclic dinucleotide, they're antiviral, and that this is um, this antiviral activity requires seeing a TBK1, the next thing I wanted to address is what other downstream um, pathways is being acting through to inhibit virus infection. So as I mentioned, um, mammalian sting acts through interferon and F-kappa B and other um, pathways. Drosophila don't have interferon signaling, um, so I wasn't able to look at that, um, but they do have NF-kappa B. And unfortunately, I don't have time to show you that data, but um, in the intestine, at least, it looks like Sting and NF-kappa B are not um, involved in the same pathway. So I next decided to look at the role of autophagy um, in Symbis infection. So I just um, infected a panel of flies where essential autophagy genes were knocked down. Um, and I see when ATG5, P62, which is a cargo receptor for autophagy, and when ATG, ATG16 are knocked down, um, there's an increase in Symbis RNA levels in the intestine, suggesting that autophagy is antiviral in the intestine. Um, so I next wanted to see um, what is activating autophagy um, and whether infection of Symbis is what is inducing autophagy in the intestine. So when autophagy is activated, the, a cargo receptor like P62, which I just showed you is antiviral, um, binds a ubiquinated um, cargo, like a viral protein and then recruits out of bag, um, autophagy proteins and membranes, and then this surrounds the cargo. So on this membrane, um, the autophagy protein ATG8 is conjugated to the membrane. So there are these flies where ATG8 is tagged as in cherry. So you can visualize um, autophagy occurring through ATG8 puncta formation by immunofluorescence. Um, so I took these flies and either fed rapamycin, which is an activator of autophagy, which should increase um, the number of ATG puncta that I see in the intestine, which is indeed what I see, or I fed um, Symbis virus. And I see um, that Symbis virus um, also increases the number of ATG puncta in the intestine. So that leads me um, to this model where the microbiota is potentially providing this pool of cyclic dinucleotides, and um, these cyclic dinucleotides block Symbis infection in a Sting and TBK1 dependent manner. Um, I also see that autophagy is antiviral in the intestine, um, but I need to do more work to determine whether autophagy is induced by Symbis or um, whether um, feeding of cyclic dinucleotides themselves can influence autophagy induction, and then um, also determine if this is being a TBK1 dependent. Um, I've also shown that there are clearly tissue differences um, in uh, how the microbiome influences Symbis infection. Um, so I'd like to do more work to characterize what these differences are. Um, 
And um, then um, there's a question of how cyclic dinucleotides are entering cells. And because um, most in vitro experiments require transfection of cyclic dinucleotides into cells. And in the last year or two, there have been um, an increasing number of reports about um, cyclic dinucleotide transporters. So it's also something I'm, in, I'm interested in um, investigating further. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone in the Cherry Lab. Um, I should point out that Beth Gould is a technician in the lab that did all the injections for the systemic infections um, that I showed you guys. Um, I'd like to thank my thesis committee for their input and funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions now that you might have. Great talk, Alicia. I did not see, oh, wait, I think one just came in. Uh, so you have a question. Uh, cyclic dye GMP is a bacteria cy cytoplasmic second messenger. Do you think bacteria need to die for release of the cyclic dye GMP or is there an exporter? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. As far as I know, C dye AMP and bacteria have known um, exporters. Um, but for C. dye GMP, there hasn't been an equivalent exporter found. So it is possible that they do have an exporter and it just hasn't discovered yet. Um, and I also think it's like likely that the microbiota are dying as they're dying, they're releasing this. So it could potentially both could be playing a role in providing the cyclotinucleotides in the intestine. Okay. And it's I, unclear at the moment, which is it is. Next question for you is this. Which groups of microbiota would be depleted by your antibiotic treatment? Do you know which specific bacteria groups would provide this antiviral protection? Yeah, um, so when we antibiotic treat, um, I didn't show, I guess, the plating data just because it kind of clutters up the slide, but um, all of the species are cleared. So both gram negative and gram positive are gone. Um, and from the sequences that I looked at in NCBI, both gram negatives and gram positives um, produce C dye GMP. Um, and gram positives also usually produce C dye AMP. So it seems like there's probably a role for both um, in this signaling. Very good. Uh, one more question. Um, do pathogenic bacteria translocate higher levels of CDI nucleotide and thus induce higher levels of antiviral response. At least in Listeria, the multi-drug efflux pump can secrete CDI AMP. That might have been a mouthful for you, sorry. Um, so I've never done um, an experiment in which I infected flies with bacteria that I know, like, like um, Listeria that um, would be producing CDI AMP and then also infected. Um, I do have listeria um, and E. coli strains that, um, in the case of listeria, lack the um, the export pump. So then I know there would be no CDI AMP production um, or E. coli where they're overexpressing CDI AMP. And because I think that's a great experiment to do if I can see correlation of more or less CDI AMP with protection or not from infection. Um, there's just been a technical issue with trying to get the bacteria to colonize the intestine, um, which has been pretty frustrating because I think that would be a great thing to do. Just technically, it hasn't worked out. Very good. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, we have one more minute, but you're, you answered all your questions. So if you have any further, you could message Alicia directly on the chat function. I'm gonna pass it over to Marissa to introduce our next student speaker. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marissa Egan and I am a third year graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm currently the treasurer of the EPA ASM student chapter board. Our next speaker is Dr. Ruchika Dehenwal, a postdoctoral fellow from Dr. Dieter Schifferly's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. She will be presenting her really exciting and impressive work demonstrating that Salmonella OMVs serve as traps for antibacterial host molecules. Take it away, Ruchika. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, let me just share my screen. There you go. 
I hope this is visible. Yep, we can see it. Thank you. Um, so today I would be talking about bacterial outer membrane vesicles and how they interact with host antimicrobial uh, components and how this helps in bacterial pathogenesis. The pathogen of interest in our lab is Salmonella enterica. Okay, there go. Salmonella enterica, which is a gram-negative intracellular pathogen. This infects via the oral route and once into the intestine, it crosses the intestinal epithelial barrier where it is then taken up by the macrophages. Since Salmonella is an intracellular pathogen, it can both survive and replicate very well within the host cell. When in the host cell, the bacterium is contained in a very specialized vacuole called as Salmonella containing vacuole, where the host cell tries to employ several stress effectors on the bacteria trying to kill it. For example, low acidic pH or low nutrient availability and cationic antimicrobial peptides. But Salmonella is a very smart pathogen. It activates its two component system, 4P4Q, which help in resistance against all these stress effectors and therefore survival of the bacteria. The 4P4Q is an environmental sensor. It senses the low pH and low magnesium in the vacuole, thereby activating a set of genes called as patch or the 4PQ activated genes or represses another set of genes called as PRGs, which is the 4PQ repressed genes. This activation and repression leads to down-regulation of SPI1 type 3 secretion system and up-regulation of SPI2 type 3 secretion system, which helps in nutrient acquisition and therefore the bacterial survival. The 4P4Q also leads to an altered antigen presentation on the bacterial surface proteome. It also modifies the outer membrane components of the bacteria like LPS, therefore increasing the defense of the bacteria against cationic antimicrobial peptides. Talking about the bacterial outer membrane, the outer membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer decorated with several outer membrane proteins. And with these uh, branch structures called as LPS, LPS or the lipopolysaccharide is the major antigenic component of any gram-negative bacteria. This LPS is made up of three regions, an outer O antigen, a middle core, and an inner lipid A. The lipid A of the bacteria at 7.6 pH chemically looks somewhat like this with two negatively charged phosphate groups, which are highly approachable by the cationic antimicrobial peptide and therefore can kill the bacteria. But when the bacterium is present in the vacuole, it senses the low pH and low magnesium, therefore activating the 4PQ system, which then derivatize these phosphates with phosphoethanolamine, which is a more positively charged moiety, therefore making the bacterial outer membrane more resistant to cationic antimicrobial peptides. 4PQ activation also activates other genes like LPXO that hydroxylates lipid A, patch B that adds a palmitoyl chain to the lipid A, and patch L that deacylates lipid A. These changes make the lipid A and therefore the bacterial outer membrane more stable for survival under the stressed conditions. Recently, it was identified that when a bacteria is grown in 7.6 pH and high magnesium conditions, recapitulating the extracellular environmental conditions, is then transitioned into a low pH and low magnesium condition, recapitulating the intravacular conditions, the bacteria now started, starts to increase an OMB, its OMB production. OMB production or the outer membrane vesicles are nothing but 20 to 200 nanometer big vesicles that are derived from the outer membrane of the bacteria. These contain periplasm in its lumen along with some toxins and some proteins. These vesicles help in eliciting inflammatory response, delivery of toxins, and cell-to-cell -cell communication. The group also identified that the, this increase in OMB production is 4PQ dependent. So we asked, what are the 4PQ activated genes that are involved in OMB production? Also, what is the role of these 4PQ induced OMBs in bacterial pathogenesis? So for our experiments, we grew the bacteria in low pH and low magnesium conditions for activation of 4PQ. 
and we isolated OMDs from these bacteria and analyzed by transmission electron microscopy and nanoparticle tracking analysis. The nanoparticle tracking analysis is a technique which is based on the principle that when these tiny vesicles are bombarded with laser, they reflect light. And this reflected light is then detected by a detector and therefore can give us a fair estimation of size and the concentration of the vesicles. So for our experiments, we created several gene deletion mutants of various 4PQ activated genes and analyzed how many OMVs are being produced by this particular bacteria now. Recently, it was identified that patch P is an important player in OMV production. And also we saw that deletion of patch P reduced the number of vesicles being produced by the bacteria and therefore served as a very good positive control. We also identified another novel gene called as patch C, which when deleted, significantly reduced the number of vesicles being produced as much as the deletion of 4P gene itself. We also analyzed other PAD genes like PAD N, PAD L, PGTE, LPXO, and PMRAB, and found that the deletion of these genes had a very weak effect on the OMB production, suggesting that PAD C is a very is an important regulator for OMB production, and therefore we focused on this for our later studies. So we used in our next experiment a 4PC strain. A 4PC strain is a a uh, strain where 4P is constitutively active and therefore produces significantly high number of vesicles in comparison to the wild type. And when PAD C was deleted in a 4P C background, the number of vesicles produced went significantly down. In fact, when we overexpressed PAD C in a 4P deletion mutant background, the number of vesicles produced went significantly up, suggesting that PAD C is an important regulator for OMB production. Next, we wanted to characterize what is the role of these 4PQ induced OMBs in bacterial pathogenesis. And so we asked, what is PATC? Now, PATC is an outer membrane protein that has two homologs in Salmonella, namely RCK and OMPX. There's another homolog in Yersinia pestis, which is called as A. And this is all that we know about PATC right now. But we also know that RCK and A are two very important complement evasion proteins for Salmonella and Yersinia. And both can inhibit classical lectin and alternative pathway of complement. So consequent, consequent question arises, can PADC also resist, resist complement attack or not? And so uh, there was a study done in back 1994 by Heffen and et al, where they suggested that PADC is not a complement evasion protein. But a more recent study by Nishio et al in Salmonella cholera Swiss suggested that PADC is a complement evasion protein. And since there was a contradiction between the two reports, so we asked, is the typhimurium PADC a complement evasion protein or not? To which we answered that yes, PADC from typhimurium does mediate resistance to complement attack. In this experiment, we took bacteria that were grown under 4PQ inducing conditions and incubated it with human serum. After 60 minutes, the survival of the bacteria was calculated. And we found that deletion of PADC, just like the deletion of RCK, which is a known complement evasion protein of Salmonella, made the bacteria highly susceptible to getting killed by complement, just like the deletion of the 4P gene itself, suggesting that PADC does mediate resistance to complement attack. We used a PGTE gene deletion mutant as a positive control and analyzed other PADGE mutants also and found that deletion of these other genes like PADGE P or PADGE L did not mediate any resistance to complement attack, suggesting that PADGE C is involved in resistance to complement attack. But are the OMVs produced by PADGE C also important? To analyze this, we used purified OMVs in equal number, both from wild type bacteria and PADC mutant bacteria indicated by red and blue over here and incubated them with the wild type uh, Salmonella typhimurium in the presence of serum and found that with increasing number of OMVs incubated with the bacteria, the bacterial survival also increased in a dose dependent manner. In fact, the survival of the bacteria was more enhanced when the OMVs were, when the OMVs that 
were incubated with the bacteria were isolated from 5.8 pH, that is the 4 pq induce, inducing conditions, suggesting that only the bad C expressing ONDs that were isolated under the 4 pq inducing conditions are protective to the bacteria in a dose dependent manner. And we found this profile too for both wild type typhimurium and also for Padsy deletion mutant. But are the Padsy homologs RCK, OMPX, and A also involved in OMB production? To answer this, we found that neither the deletion of RCK, OMPX, or overexpression of RCK affected the OMB production. Only the Padsy deletion reduced the number of vesicles and PADC overproduction increased the number of vesicles and salmonella. Also, the expression of A, a Yersinia protein in salmonella did not affect the OMB production, suggesting that only PADC and not RCK and OMPX or A mediate resistance to complement attack in an OMB dependent manner. Later, we asked what part of the complement we have to first understand that the complement system can be divided into three, alternative, lectin, and classical pathway, all of which are dependent on the presence of a divalent cation. Where classical and lectin pathway require a calcium ion, alternative pathway requires a magnesium ion. So if you add EGTA to the complex, you can block both classical and lectin pathway. And if you add EDTA, you can block all the three pathways, which we did. We incubated the bacteria with the serum in the presence of EGTA or EDTA and found that when the bacteria were incubated in the presence of EGTA and the alternative pathway was still active, the bacteria was still getting killed. But when we added EDTA and all three pathways were blocked, the bacteria started to survive more. That means the bacteria are getting killed in an alternative pathway dependent manner. And when we incubated OMBs and more so the PADC expressing wild type OMBs, the bacteria started to survive even more, suggesting that these bacteria are blocking the alternative pathway of complement. But what component of the complement? Like there are several key players involved. Since C3 is a very important player in all the three pathways, we focused on C3 first. C3 is a very big protein, which when activated is cleaved into C3A and C3B. C3B then goes and binds to the bacterial surface activating the membrane attack complex formation and kills the bacteria. But when there are some complement inhibitors present in the complex, like factor H, factor I, or vitronectin, this C3B is degraded into IC3B, or the inactive C3B, which cannot kill the bacteria, and the bacteria survives. And this IC3B can be detected on the gel as a 68 kilodalton and 46 kilodalton band. So, for our next experiment, we used equal number of purified OMBs from wild type and Padsy mutant bacteria and incubated it with serum. These OMBs were then pelleted and a supernatant containing unbound complement and the pellets containing complement bound to the OMBs was collected. This was then ran on gel and analyzed for the presence of C3B. And we found that only the wild type OMBs showed the presence of a 68 kilodalton and 46 kilodalton band, and not the PADC mutant ONDs, suggesting that these PADC expressing wild type ONDs not just bound to the C3B, but also were able to degrade it. We also found that incubation of bacterial cells with the ONDs significantly inhibited the C3 deposition on bacterial surface. As we found, there was a significantly low amount of C3B associated with the bacteria when they were incubated with PADC expressing OMBs in comparison to the bacteria that were incubated without any OMBs or bacteria that were incubated with RCK expressing OMBs. Which means these PADC expressing OMBs not just bind to C3 but also degrade it. But how does it do so? Does it recruit some kind of complement inhibitor? And so we incubated equal number of ONDs from wild type PADC mutant and RCK mutant bacteria with the human serum and found that all three were able to recruit a complement inhibitor called as factor H. PADC mutant could be recruiting factor H due to the presence of RCK and PGTE, 
both of which are known complement evasion proteins of salmonella and can recruit factor H. RCK could also be recruiting this factor H due to the presence of PGTE and maybe because of PADC. And therefore, we created a four mutant where RCK, ONPX, PADC, and PGTE all were absent. And then overexpressed PADC and RCK in this four mutant background and found that expression of PADC made these OMBs recruit a significantly high amount of factor H in comparison to OMBs that expressed RCK. In fact, when we incubated recombinant protein PADC and RCK with purified factor H, both were able to recruit factor H, but PADC did so more strongly, suggesting that these PADC expressing OMBs recruit complement inhibitor factor H that helps in degradation of C3. Therefore, in the end, we conclude that Salmonella typhimurium resists complement attack by both the expression of PADC and by increasing the OMB production that help in degradation of the C3. We propose that these ONBs act as decoy molecules that help in C3B depl uh, depletion, therefore preventing the membrane attack complex formation on the bacteria and hence the survival. In the end, I would like to thank the members of Shifterly Lab, Brodsky Lab and Shin Lab for helping with various experiments and suggestions, Prashant's Lab for helping with nanocyte and Boomin Lab for helping with the creation of various constructs. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Ruchika. That was an amazing talk, really beautiful data. Um, looks like we have a question in the chat from Dr. Tam. He asked, when you induce OMV production, what are the relative abundance of PAG-C in OMV versus bacteria? Are PAG-C differentially trafficked to the OMV? Um, just, just one moment. What do I... Okay, uh, the question was, when, when you induce one because of the Okay, we are testing this. We are doing a proteomic analysis and we want to identify how much protein is present, how much fat C is present in the bacterial outer membrane versus the ONDs. But there was a study uh, which was recently published which suggested that fat C is um, preferentially enriched in the ONDs. But what's the percentage? We do not know yet and we do want to analyze that. Thanks so much. Um, let's see if other questions pour in. Um, in the meantime, I actually have a curiosity question. So really neat work with Salmonella typhimurium. Have, um, has anyone, or are you interested in characterizing OMV production in other servoirs of sal Salmonella, like uh, typhi for the human part? Yes, we have done a PADC deletion mutant in Salmonella typhi also, and in typhi also we found that deletion of PADC does reduce the OMV production. Not as much as the typhi mutant, but it does reduce it. Okay, interesting. Thanks, Ruchika. So if anyone has any other questions, um, please place them in the chat. Okay, um, Dr. Kutzler has a question. She said, beautiful data, um, since OMV functions to inhibit those immunity, um, does the function change in biofilms? Does that play a role? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. Does the function of OMV change in biofilms? We do not know, but in OM OMVs are, OMBs do help in cell-to-cell -cell communication in bacteria also, and they do help in biofilm formation. That's also a study which has all, already been done, but how, what components do they interact with for the biofilm formation, we do not know. And that would be a very interesting thing to be studied. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ruchika, for an amazing talk. And thank you to all of the speakers for this morning's um, really great and exciting session. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kutzler um, before we have our poster sessions and lunch break. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, again, um, I'd like to echo Marissa's, com Marissa's comments. What a great morning session. Thanks everyone for attending. I'm going to um, just share a few slides just to give some instructions for the rest of the day. So right now we are uh, ready to start our lunch break. And I just would uh, like to um, ask that our attendees please attend and visit our poster presentations. We have two sessions today. The odd number posters, the presenters will be in, will be in their Zoom rooms from 11.15 to 12.15. 
Uh, and then our even number poster presenters will be in their Zoom rooms from 12.15 to 1.15. And I, in the conference abstract booklet that you received this morning by email, I also dropped it into the chat. So if you scroll up, there is a uh, PDF that looks like this, where we have all of our poster presenters, their names, institutions, uh, their abstract titles, their abstracts are in the conference booklet, and then there's a link to their presentation room in this document. Some of our uh, Zoom rooms require a password, and that is all, all the information you need to be able to visit our poster presenters are shown here. And so have lunch, take a break, visit our posters, and then we want to make sure to invite you back for our early afternoon session where we have Dr. Taji Harris uh, from the University of Virginia School of Medicine leading us off at 1.30 p.m. So after you visit our posters, please return uh, to see Dr. Harris as well as Ron and Hager, two of our graduate students who uh, were selected to give talks today. And then after the early afternoon session, we have our final session, which includes a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Resende Mela Silva um, from Dr. Segal's lab. And then we have our 2020 PESCA lecturer, Dr. Stanley Plotkin, who will finish the day today. So with that, again, I'd like to thank the student officers for moderating the talks this morning, uh, Dr. Vincent Tam for being our guru, helping us with our YouTube live stream and our Zoom today, as well as all of our, our morning speakers for such a great session. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you back at 1.30.